Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun podcast. I'm your host, Dave Wakeman. My guest today is Dave Harland, the word man himself. Uh, this is an excellent podcast. We teach you all kinds of stuff about writing better copy uh, and making marketing messages that are not boring. So this was not great. Before we talk about Dave and before I get to the conversation, I want to remind you, as always, check out my website. It's DaveWakeman.com. Lots of new stuff for the new year uh, and beyond. There is a recent blog post that I want to point everyone towards where I write about my experience over the last 12 to 18 months uh, doing some really big market research projects. Some of the lessons I learned, some of the important things that I took away from market research. uh, I found this, I wrote it. It was super helpful for me to help figure out what I was thinking and working on and learned. Uh, and I think it's helpful for you. So check it out. It's at DaveWakeman.com on my blog. Um, make sure you get my newsletter on Fridays. It's called Talking Tickets. You can get it at TalkingTickets.Substack.com or you can sign up uh, in the pop-up box on my website, DaveWakeman.com. Uh, all about marketing and selling live events. Make sure you check out my friends at Booking Protect, www.bookingprotect.com, a cover genius company. They will be at Intix in Seattle, my hometown, Seattle. I was born in Bremerton uh, in January. Uh, Cover genius company now. uh, Same great customer service, more data and more insights to help you understand how to use refund protection to help your customers make the decision to purchase tickets, right? Uh, The data is clear. People are using refund protection more than ever before in all facets of their lives. Uh, Check them out, bookingprotect.com. The rumor is there may be a juice bar at Intix, but I can't guarantee that. You're going to have to go if you want to know. All right. So make sure you check them out. Bookingprotect.com. Back to Dave Harland. He has a newsletter that comes out on Fridays. Right after you finish reading uh, Talking Tickets, you go read The Word Man. Uh, yeah. I suggest everybody get it. Dave is one of the funniest and best copywriters in the world. Uh, and it was such a joy to get to talk to him because I I, I don't get to talk to him nearly enough. Uh, in this episode, we talk about uh, his love of Liverpool. Um, you can't have everything. Uh, but we talk about his background in journalism and really how his training as a journalist helped him become a great copywriter. We talk about boring messages. We talk about how he comes up with his ideas. We talk about some of the themes that he uses. We talk about what it means to um, have a content strategy. You know, walking the line of jokes versus not jokes. Um, you know, reaching the right people. Uh, don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, you know, we talk about why he is a uh, more of a generalist. We um, even do a pretty great um, walkthrough where we talk about how to um, create an email that's going to get a response. Uh, so this is a really, really great episode of The Business of Fun. So I can't wait for you to listen to it. So without more from me, here's my conversation with Dave Harland. All right. I am very excited to welcome the word man himself, Dave Hardland, to the Business of Fun podcast. Dave, what's up? All right, Dave. Thanks for having me, mate. Buzzing yeah. to be on. This is going to be this is going to be great. Uh, two Daves. Uh, so if if they if you hate anything on here, just blame it on Dave. It'll be fine. That's it. Dave squared. Yeah. The square yeah, is Dave. Squared. Dave. <laughs> yeah. So I love your newsletter. It's called The Word, and I read it every Friday, uh, right after I get done reading mine. That's uh, actually, I don't read mine at all because once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, you have a really unique and great voice about copywriting, marketing, and selling. And I think you have a really good philosophy for how you approach things. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came up with the idea for the word and how you developed your like voice and your philosophy of your newsletter and like the work you do? Yeah, sure. So the, the word's been going for around about two years now. So it was towards the end of the first year of the pandemic um, where I'd been doing LinkedIn posts, LinkedIn content, pretty much solid uh, every weekday for probably the previous four years or so. Um, I had my own repository of these LinkedIn posts, you know, a Word doc, which was about 
800 pages long. Um, but yeah, I saw a load of people starting stuff and I felt a little bit left out. People were starting podcasts and newsletters and writing books and um, I hadn't really done anything that creative was. I'd done is kept me head down and worked on client stuff really. So yeah, it got to um, got to about the September of the year of, of uh, COVID. So well, about six months in. And yeah, it'd been on my list for a while, but I always thought, you know what, too much hassle. This, you know, I've, I'm, I'm putting an added pressure on myself to produce this thing every week, which, you know, if I was going to do it, I was definitely going to be doing it um, quite regularly. Um, but in the end, I thought, you know what, let's just let's just do it and see how it goes. I've just been having a um, the, the, probably the month beforehand. I've been having a good chat with my mate Eddie Schleiner, who's a copywriter based in Chicago, direct response copywriter. He's got a wildly successful newsletter called um, the Very Good Copy Newsletter. I think he, yeah, he's got like fifty thousand subscribers, or maybe even more. But back then, I'd just been yeah, just chatting to him. Um, probably about yeah, about a month before I launched, or two months before I launched it, and he was like, "Oh, you should have your own newsletter, mate. You, you know, you, you do all of this stuff on LinkedIn." Um, why not, you know, talk about some of that stuff, um, you, you know, you can increase this list. If anything ever happens on LinkedIn or whatever, you've still got this list to fall back mm-hmm. on. So I was like, yeah, sound, let's let's give it a whirl. Now, disclaimer, my background is journalism. So, I've, I, I, you know, but marketing is something I've kind of learned as I've been going. Um, so even like, like Eddie thought we this flywheel technique, which was at the end of every LinkedIn post, put a link to your newsletter and then within your newsletter, put links to your your content and when he told me this i was like oh man this is like genius this is amazing it's like pure marketing basics just tying all your stuff together so um fine i was always fine with the, the storytelling the writing with you know having that journalism background um it was just the yeah the more strategic marketing stuff um and, and tying everything together which i wasn't really kind of that okay with so um yeah put i put it together took the leap prepped about the first four um newsletters um and started shouting about it on social media for about a month before i launched it um built up to about 1500 subscribers and then press go so it's been it's been going ever since um and that voice that you you mentioned at the start again um not being a marketer i kind of fell into that by accident i mean i mean fell into really understanding that that was my voice and that was my kind of selling power almost um you know leaning mm-hmm. on the um the silliness the daft the, the you know the, the humor that i i try and um display on um on linkedin and, and, and through the newsletter and most of my own stuff really um and that in itself the, the kind of the humor side of things it was about um probably about a year into posting on linkedin which when i first started linkedin was um or when i first yet yeah, started posting on linkedin it had only just um, changed its, its the, the face of it to look like a little bit like Facebook. So it had its own newsfeed, and everybody on there was like, "Hi, I'm Gordon. You know, I run a baking company, and we do, you know, X, Y, Z." And I was just like, "I guess if I get if I play my cards right, there's an opportunity here to be the ant to be the anti boring person on LinkedIn." So that's what I did. Really, I just started posting um, nothing too like crazy, just like tips, but with maybe a little funny, a couple of funny lines in there or a, a, a humorous takeaway, still providing, you know, providing value. Um, but just in my own kind of voice and my own, um, yeah, my own style, which I kind of just, it's just how I speak. It's just, it's just me being normal. Like if you speak to me, it's, you'll see the same phrases that I'll use within yeah. those posts. I'll use my own dialect. I'll, you know, when I'm commenting on stuff, I'll, I'll take the piss out of, People who are taking themselves seriously, exactly the way I do if there was somebody in this office here, take themselves too seriously. So I, I, I try and keep it as, um, yeah, to pardon the, the, the wanky phrase, as authentic as I can um, with, with regards to my kind of personal brand. So so that's it really, yeah. Strategy, it, it always has been since that since I joined really since I joined LinkedIn and, and saw that the funny stuff, the daft stuff kind of worked and was true to me. I've always just gone, right, my strategy is, do funny stuff, make people smile, um, which has kind of two, it wins in two ways because it, you know, it, it attracts the type of followers who want it and want to read and consume that entertaining stuff. But it also gets me the types of clients that, that want to do that fun stuff as well. And who've already identified we're really yeah. boring. We, we want some more fun stuff or, you know, the funner clients who they just need, you know, more ideas on how, on how to, 
to to kind of ramp that up. They come, they yeah. they now tend to come to me. Yeah, you you opened the door for a lot of stuff. So that was like that was a really great introduction for us. Um, I want to start with this 800 pages of LinkedIn message, like uh, posts that you had created. Where do you get your ideas? Like, you know, because I think that one of the challenges people have is like going, I don't have anything to say. Obviously, you got 800 pages, so you have something to say. So where do, where do you how do you how do you create these ideas? Like, where do they come from? Um, again, quite inadvertently, when I started, I, I, I started kind of building up these themes almost. So. I had stories with a marketing lesson at the end. I think that was the, one of the first ways I started doing it. So I was thinking, right, how can I tell a story about something that's happened to me, something that's happened in my life, something that's happened in business, that's going to have a valuable kind of market lesson at the end. A bit like Aesop's fables, you know, where he, mm-hmm. it's you know the dog drops his bone in the in the in the uh, <laughs> in the water after he sees his reflection, and then he's like, oh, yeah, ne- neither of them have got their bones. So there's some, there's always some kind of you know funny funny-ish story which leads to a kind of takeaway so i thought right stories is one way so once a week say i was posting a story so straight away there was there was you know i was posting week every weekday i was you know spend, spending the weekends with my family but yeah monday to friday i was like right there's one day of the week sorted bang i'll just come up with a story i'll write a story and it, it could be anything from you know something from when i was a kid to a weird thing that a client had said to me in the week or you know, it could be something I'd overheard on the bus, a phrase I'd overheard on the bus, you know, going to a night out or something. And it just pricked my ears up. And I thought, oh, that's a funny way of saying things. I'm sure, I'm sure that if, if it made me take notice, I'm sure other people are going to take notice as well. Obviously, the the kind of, the the uh, the tough bit is worming in the really, um, you know, thinly veiled marketing message at the end. But I think, you know, there's a way, there's a way that you can shoehorn a kind of market and an impact, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, message into most um, most funny stories. Um, so yeah, so that was one of them. Um, another one was just jokes with um, unexpected endings. So yeah, I'd tell a you know a, a really classic joke, but have a twist the ending so it was like nothing that they'd expect. You know, a classic kind of comedians comedians trick, I suppose. Um, and yeah, talking about comedians, I mean, growing up, I was I was massively into, um, you know, British comedy back back in the, you know, when I was like 10, 11. I remember my mum, my mum used to work nights in a nursing home on a Thursday, so that was like the night when the BBC um, two, it was like their comedy night. So me and my dad would watch all the classic BBC kind of comedies that were on at the time, which was like. Um, you know the Fast Show and Harry Enfield and um, the British British people will, will will probably get these more. Um, yeah, Fast Show, Harry Enfield, um, Vic and Bob, Reeves and Mortimer, that, that, all of that type of stuff. Which again, it was, it was deeply rooted in kind of characters and observational comedy and just kind of wacky surrealism. Um, it, be, be, I mean, before that, I was a big fan of Monty Python, and since then, it's been the likes of The Office and Ricky Gervais. And you know, Kirby enthusiasm, that kind of awkwardly, um, yeah, awkwardly funny observational stuff, I suppose. Um, so yeah, so um, the, the, I mean, the, the comedy, my love of comedy, has kind of helped, kind mm-hmm. of de- devise other um, little little themes um, mm-hmm. w- within my kind of content strategy. So I, I you know, I make up characters and, and tell stories from their perspective. Um, I do loads of observational stuff. Many so of can't... uncles. You got tons yeah, of uncles. So loads of uncles. <laughs> yeah, I've got one very famous one who everyone, every, everyone wants to meet. But yeah, he's always on a, a far away job in, yeah. you know, Costa Rica or you know, um, French yeah. Polynesia. Always he just left. Away. He just left the room too, like right before exactly. I got before Donate. we got together. Donate. He's gone. Yeah. He's already yeah. gone. Yeah, I'll shout him back in a minute. So. Uh, so yeah, characters. <laughs> um, the ob- ob- I mean, observational stuff's dead easy to do. It's just it's just thinking of, you know, something that everyone experiences in the industry and shines a light back on it. So you can do that. Well, I don't the one um, or I done a series um, a few weeks ago within the newsletter. I just took famous scenes from Hollywood um, and put little um, kind of captions on them. So one of them was like, um, you know, that moment where um, what's his name, Indiana Jones. Gets the eye in the, in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He swaps the idol for the bag of the bag of sand or whatever. So I'll put a caption pointing to the idol as um, a 25 
what was it? I know it was a 10 page uh, website that you'd spent the past two weeks perfecting. And then the bag of sand was 25 English pounds. So that was just kind of illustrating how shit we are at pricing when we first start off in our careers. So, yep. um, yeah, just little relatable things, which we don't always, they're not always aimed at clients. A lot of them are just kind of relatable for, you know, other creatives and copywriters more so to kind of build <laughs> build yeah there's a strategy an evil strategy behind it to build the followers but just to have a laugh and just to yeah just to keep everybody within my networks um keep the yeah keep the humor um so yeah long-winded answer loads of little themes and, and um just kind of fill in those theme buckets up over the years have enabled me to never really run out of yeah. um never really you know i've always got an idea there when, when yeah. it's time to go i, I never um, you know, and I don't stress about it too much. If, if you haven't got something to post, I'm not, I'm not one of the type who'll just go, oh, I'll throw a shit little joke on there just for the sake of it. It's like, it's, it's, I'm, I'm kind of, again, sounds like I'm, I'm proud of everything that's on there. Like, it doesn't, I wouldn't just put a, put a something yeah. up there for the sake of it. It, it, it kind of, um, yeah, it, it would, everything I post would kind of be, be within my kind of yearbook of life. And when, yeah. you know, when it, when my life flashes before my eyes, but I'd never go, oh, you know what? Regret posting that. And even if it did shit, so what? <laughs> that damn LinkedIn post was like the one thing I regret about my life. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yeah. Bloody hell. LinkedIn yeah. sent me smiling downwards. Well, I mean, to be honest, that's, again, always in the back of my mind because because I kind of don't take much seriously um, within, within business. Um, I've always thought, is there going to be that one day where I do take it too far? And I, I, you know, I cancel inadvertently cancel myself from the kind of marketing world. But thankfully, touch wood, it's never, it's never got that too far. And I never do anything too close to the bone. It's always, it's always silly. And I try and everything I put on there is defendable. I'll never post something on there just to be controversial for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. You know, but do yeah. a, you know, a daft joke. Um, I would say, you know. yeah, that, that's like a real, that, that idea too is like a real thing. Like, oh, you're, I'm worried about canceling myself because I think that stops people from doing stuff. And what you said too about it, it's always defendable. I would say that even when I'm completely wrong, I can defend my th- my logic for something. Um, because, it, you know, sometimes like you don't get, I think social media or like all this stuff, it tries to train people to think that like every idea is perfectly formed and uh, every idea is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Now, some ideas are, are completely garbage and some ideas, they take a few iterations before they get right. But like the, the through line that you're carrying is, is right. And you know, that's a, uh, I tell people like, stop taking yourself seriously. Like we were saying before we even started recording for most of my life, I spent selling tickets to shows, uh, to get sports, to concerts, to theater. And, helping drunk people get laid that was like most of my <laughs> career how serious can i take myself and like Happy. the fact that like people are all the time like going oh uh, like about, very serious about this i go i'm getting people drunk or i'm getting them like <laughs> hanging out with their kids or like ma- me- meeting their girlfriend or boyfriend i go i don't have anything in the world to be serious about in fact if i did i'd be an ass <laughs> but that's just me <laughs> Which brings me to the second question I wanted to ask you about this part was um, you talked about attracting the right followers. A lot of people, they struggle with this idea, right? Because like you said, not for everybody. I'm not for everybody. No, every business should be like for a specific group of people. How did you get comfortable with that? Because like we're fairly similar and it's just us. It's just Dave and Dave, right? Uh, we're one man band shops, right? It can be easy. It can be easy just to say, I'll take anybody. But that is really a um, that's a strategy for suffering. I, I've found uh, I haven't found it, there are any positives to it in most cases, yeah, but it's a hard for people. Yeah. How did you become comfortable with that? Mm, I mean, I was in the exact same boat. I was uh, at the very start. I was for everybody. I didn't really know a what my voice was, b who my target client was. I'd worked in house as a copywriter for probably 10 years before going freelance and starting my own thing. So yeah, when the time come, I knew clearly in my head, I didn't want to um, focus on a niche or a niche. Sorry. I get the pronunciations. Um, 
the difference over there. But yeah, I didn't want to focus on a particular sector. I always industry. say it wrong anyway. So that, yeah, yeah, niche, yeah. niche, niche. I know there's slight differences yet, but I work with US clients anyway, so I'm I'm hot on the, the the differences in spelling and pronunciation. Sometimes the rhymes often catch people out. E- yeah. Even like in the UK, a, a word up here in Liverpool is pronounced it like Bath and Bath, like pronounced yeah. differently. It's uh-huh. just. You, You've got to be aware of the the rhymes, but yeah, off on a tangent we go. Um, so yeah, I was a I was a you know, pure generalist and knew that I didn't want to specialise in in any sector or industry. So I was just taking on anything. I mean, I, I was I wasn't saying yes to really stuff that I wasn't really capable of, like you know, really right. in depth blog posts on technical stuff or stuff that was really boring. I was I was tending to say no to, but I, again, I've been really lucky that I've never really had to scramble around for work because I'd found that the ability to, to, to bring clients in through inbound marketing on LinkedIn really early. I've never, ever once in the past six years, again, Touchwood, um, had to do any outbound stuff and had to scramble around for clients. So, yeah, I was quite, it was in that lucky position where I could, um, I could do my own kind of trial and error testing almost because the because the the client pipeline again to pardon a, you know a marketing phrase was always it was always full and there was always a next next person knocking on the door. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't like I was um, I wasn't really precious over everything I did. I wasn't like oh you know I'm, uh, this next um, series of posts that I put out really has to kind of pay the mortgage. It was always just try, trial and error. Then LinkedIn, yeah. I see that as a, a great kind of testing platform. So um, so that's where I really, yeah, w- w- once I um, became became a freelance, started taking on clients from all sorts of industries, you know, quite dull stuff anyway. My, my, um, my approach at the start was clarity first, personality second. If it's, if it's clear in people's minds, you can then ramp up the personality um, as much as you can. But then it was only really after the year of doing that um, where I was getting loads of clients who, again, were just you know, really, really dull industries and they weren't asking for personality. They were just, they were just like, you know, can you write this series of blog posts? And I was ended up doing just jobs that were just, just dull and boring. So I thought, right, how, you know, how can I do this? Right, let's ramp the funny up. Mm-hmm. And it will, back to what I said before, it will um, hopefully attract the clients that want to do that type of funny stuff. So, yeah, I had the... Um, yeah, I had the, the, the ideas to just start ramping up more of that stuff. And it was really probably about the year just before the pandemic. Um, I'd started, yeah, doing doing the jokes, the stories, the parodies of things. Mm-hmm. And on the back of that, it was it was clients getting in touch with me and saying, oh, we, we like that. Will you write that stuff for us? But then also, you know, like to counter that, I was getting less of the, the, the clients coming to me saying, you know, will you write us a thousand word blog, blog, blog series on, you know, industrial washers, I just wasn't getting those, so it was saving yeah. saving both of our time. It, it was filtering mm-hmm. out the people who would never be my kind of clients anyway, because they'd see me having a laugh and go, "Oh, you know, he's far too far yeah. too jokey for us. Let's let's swerve him." Um, so yeah, so that that's kind of ha- how I did it. Again, no no real strategy at the start. It was just um, the more I did, you know, the more I tried the the, the, the funny stuff and the daft stuff. Um, yeah. it, it it tended to. Yeah, weed out the ones who weren't interested and, and attract the ones who were. Yeah, and the re- the way you talked about being a generalist, that's uh, pretty important because like the, the business of fun, the podcast started as really dedicated only to people in uh, that market and sold live events. But mm. I realized that like, much like you, it's like, or and no, actually, I don't want to say that. I don't want to assume this. I'm going to ask you this because I'm going to tell you how I got to being a generalist. It was like going, I realized that the process of like strategy and brand strategy was pretty much the same, no matter where I went, right? You got to like diagnose your problem, come up with an approach to deal with it, and then implement your 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 strategy, right? It's like kind of the same. And I found that like, you know, a lot of times if people take themselves too seriously or, um, you know, some people just didn't have the money to pay me what I what I felt like I was worth, and mm-hmm. other people would pay me. So then I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to work for for less than I felt like I was worth anymore. Um, how did you get to be a generalist? And then on top of that, like, what is similar and what's different when you go from industry to industry? Because I've, I've and, and I've given you this framework where I think that most brand and strategy challenges are largely the same, you know, ninety nine percent. But I'm curious to see, hear from you. Yeah. So what made me a generalist again? It was it was that um, 
want the the want to get away from writing about the same stuff all the time. So I'd worked in house at a company for ten years. Um, it was a Christmas hamper company. They also did like um, gift vouchers for like rewards and incentives for businesses. So there's a fair bit going on, but. I was just, you know, I'd, when it, each year's Christmas campaign would come around, it'd be like, oh, you know, what are we going to focus on now? You know, what's the hook? It's like we've done Santa opening the advent calendar. We've done the, you know, the the reflection in the baubles. It's like, how are we going to come up with creative ideas? So just writing about the same stuff all the time, I was like, you know what, I, I, ne- I never want to do that. Um, You know, I want to... I do want to be a generalist too. I want to be writing about different products, different services, which kind of goes against or it, it um it limited the amount of um project that I'd be suitable for. Mm-hmm. So it, it it made um it made me only really suitable for the kind of top level stuff. So where um the objective was more about kind of impact and attention rather than going into the nitty gritty of um you know the specifics of a product or going um ex- too explanatory uh, which was more in the realm of content marketing anyway than than kind mm-hmm. of brand or advertising um so so yeah i i, I kind of just fo- forced my way into being a generalist um at that time and i suppose it was only once i'd um been doing the um focusing on the humor um on on social media and, and in my own newsletter it was like maybe maybe that's my niche maybe it's the it's the style and the, the kind of tone um maybe that you know that's that's what differentiates me the most mm-hmm. from, from from others and it, it kind of has been you know i'm <laughs> i kept getting known or you know i, I co-hosted the marketing meetup over here in, in liverpool um which is the the fair, it's a it's a um, like a national uh, meetup for for marketers. Um, we have them all over different cities in the UK. I think one's um, Joe who runs it. He's just started one in New York actually, gone international. But I had co-hosted the Liverpool one, and I had like three people come up to me go, "Oh, you do that funny stuff on LinkedIn, don't you?" So even <laughs> just <laughs> which I'm you know shit at taking compliments. I was like, yeah, yeah, you kind of yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm known I'm known for that now. So if anything, that's yeah. that's clearly my niche. Whether I like mm-hmm. it or not, that's that's my niche. So um, yeah, does that does that kind of answer it? <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly that's it. And and I guess like the part of, uh, the part I'm interested in is you know because you did your your training as a journalist, you yeah. kind of have had to learn marketing. So then that means um, either you've picked up really good uh, training, which is would be my hypothesis or yeah. you're very good at faking it i don't know uh one or the other um you know so what i guess where did you where did you tr- get your training as far as being a marketer because like i know that you love gary v and i love that you love uh simon Sinek and starts with why you know you, you're really a big fan of those things you know so how did you dis- discover the discover those bibles <laughs> oh man they're the, t- the two gurus in my life yeah everything they say i follow religiously um just don't tell our tony um so yeah it's yeah again it's, it's back to um the, the company that i worked at so i did journalism and then graduated worked as a, a football writer for about six months didn't go anywhere um and then we ended up being the, the um the editor of a couple of websites back at my old uni which at the time i thought i was doing journalism but i wasn't i was plugging the courses i was interviewing students to try and entice new student uh, new students there um after that i worked for, at this company that i mentioned for 10 years and it was only really a couple of years into that um working there I even understood what a copywriter was. I worked in the marketing department. I thought I was, or I, my, my job title at the time was the head of, or the, um, what was it, the, the customer newsletter or customer magazine editor. That was my job. So I was writing kind of fun human interest stories for this um, customer magazine, which went out to like 100,000 customers every few months. And it was like a mixture of like, you know, <laughs> it was not just thinking back. It's like a different life. It was like um, on the front cover, we had like um, a makeover winner. So that was our like our our cover photo was the, the winner of the previous months or the previous issues makeover. Then there were like stories of customers talking about like what it was like um, um, having their hamper arrive on Christmas morning. And it was amazing. And they didn't, they, you know, they paid bit by bit throughout the year. So it was kind of selling the dream. And again, up until like two, three years into that comp- working for that company, I just thought I was still doing the journalism when I clearly wasn't. I was I was within the marketing department only ever talking, promoting these products. Um, but it was only once um, the, the marketing director came to me and said, oh, 
do you fancy being our copywriter? And they, I think they'd been outsourcing it up, up until then, or the, the customer care team had been writing the, you know, the sales letters or whatever, and they were terrible. So I was like, yeah, sound, like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be the copywriter, you know, Google's copywriter, what's that? And then kind of just stumbled across this this entire entire um, kind of sub in sub sub industry. I don't know, yeah, sub sector, yeah. uh, sub career, if you like, um, which I'd never even heard of before. I'd heard of copy when I was doing my journalism degree. You file your copy to the mm-hmm. editor. But I'd never heard of this um, kind of, you know, branch of um, marketing, which is all about writing persuasive stuff that that makes people kind of, you know, click a, click a button or pick up yeah. a phone. And I, like, I was like, wow, sound that I, something I could actually use it. I've got this, the writing skills already. I love mm-hmm. the words and kind of knew that it was just the persuasiveness and the, the kind of behavioral science that I had to learn. So um, straight away, I was, I was onto the, you know, my bosses there at the time, like what courses can I go on to learn more? So this just sent me on a load of day courses. There was nothing, you know, I didn't do anything you know any informal really no formal training apart from just these really kind of um vocational intensive courses that taught me a load of skills so one was like how to write more powerful direct mail letters yeah. how to structure the perfect um customer email you know how to write better selling lines in your product catalog really really niche kind of courses which allowed me to pick up all of these skills and really kind of put them um you know put them to work every day in my day job so i kind of learned learned on the job and we you know we were mm-hmm. testing subject lines and i knew what would work and what wouldn't and even back then i was like the funnier ones the, the ones with a little bit more personality were getting higher clicks so it was all it was all you know going in um even at that kind of early stage um so yeah i'd kind of i kind of learned learned on on the job but then um, only really when I went full time freelance was like where I really started kind of reading up on, you know, re- I was buying all the books that I could from all the kind of great copywriters, the yeah. great marketers from over the years. And really like the networking began then. And it's only really when you see kind of re- even just like looking around at the, the kind of ads and the copy stuff that I, w- I would never even I would never have even thought of when I was working um, within that role because you're quite insular, just working on the same stuff day in day out. Um, whereas as soon as I went freelance, I was like, wow, does this what does this entire separate world? I've got you know big huge network of copywriter mates now as well, so I've learned stuff off them over the years as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so yeah, to answer the question, no formal training, but still, <laughs> still, de- still detest the um, the the kind of you know. The, the the ease at which the, all of these you know marketing yeah. bullshitters say modern marketing should be done it's and it's it, it shouldn't be that at all it's back to you know the tried and tested four p's um and um yeah the the, the old aid care methods all the really kind of old boring stuff yep. still stands true but with a little yep. modern tweak if you can kind of um test 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 on each each one um and be as creative as you can with each one that's where yeah. you, that's where you win no um no entire reinvention of the wheel like yeah like our friends gary and simon yeah well they, what they, what frustrates me about them and I, I don't really want to spend any time any more time than we've already spent because about 30 seconds of air time for them is more than enough um but what what these people try to do is they try to um they try to put the frameworks and all these things in in a box as like outdated and stale so that they can sell you on something that's really just them repackaging mm. what has already been done but the, the to me and it sounds like to you is these uh, these frameworks and these tried and tested ways of approaching things just give you the read the the freedom to be creative because then you don't have to think about it right like i got the four p's then i know exactly what what i can do i mean and to go back to what you were talking about before i never knew how much I knew about pricing until like I was like much further along. I just knew that like if I um, asked people what kind of gin they preferred when they ordered a gin and tonic at a bar, I'd get more money because my tip, uh, they'd charge them another dollar or two. So I'd get it probably at the end of the night, I'd get a couple extra bucks on my tip. And I was like, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I've, so, I've now increased it, increased my earnings a couple, a couple bucks an hour. <laughs> that's pretty freaking awesome. And, you know, and so that was like the whole thing. And then I realized like, if I discount stuff, then people don't value it as much. So then discounting is stupid. I mean, and to use my phrase, discounts are for dummies, you know, and, 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 and then all of a sudden I realized like, I knew all this stuff without really knowing I knew it. And, you know, so like then going back and taking like classes like you did, like just day courses and stuff, even though I have a marketing degree, it helped me give, give me the understanding of what 
really works and what matters. And yeah. what I'm curious about here is you talked a lot about email and subject lines and the humor thing, because I do a training from time to time. It's rare now that I've, but I've done it in the past and um, I'll see people. And this, I think this is a testament to how shitty most marketing is. Um, they will get two or 3% open rates on their emails if, if they're lucky. Mm. And from the way you're shaking your head, that doesn't sound uncommon to you either. And then like, just, I mean, I, I think you're a much better copywriter than I am here. It's like just like adding a little bit of flavor, a little bit of personality, a little bit of um, focus to your message in the subject line. You can increase those rates 10 times easy. Like you can get 20, 30 percent uh, from your point of view, because, again, the word is an amazing thing. And if people haven't signed up by now, they're really missing out because it's amazing. Uh, what would be some tips to get people to open emails better? Because I do know people ask me about this a lot because I think like you, I have a specific voice that I write with or speak with. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd say rule one, always, it's, it's back to, was it Ogilvy that said it? When you've written your headline, you've spent 80 cents of your dollar. Um, I think, was it Ogilvy or somebody else? I don't know. But it's back to... Um, never underestimate the power of that subject line if you spend you know if it takes you four hours to write your your, your newsletter or your, your you know your customer email and you spend three hours 40 minutes on what's inside and only 20 minutes on the subject line you're doing it wrong you've got to you've got to really consider what that subject line is it going to jump out from that inbox um, when people are scrolling is it going to contain mm -hmm. a phrase maybe that no one's read before if you're saying the same old stuff that all of your competitors or maybe you've even written in the past, it's just not going to stand out at all. And there's loads of little ways you can do that. You know, you can um, you can issue a promise. So you can you know, promise what's what's about to come within the email. Um, you can ask a question, you know, a question that maybe people haven't considered before. You can be really upfront with the offer, but perhaps say it in a different, a different way that, you know, rather than just say, you know, 50 percent off. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could you know phrase that in a different way whether it's you know half price or you know greatest sale ever or whatever which which is completely different to what you've done and again that word different and distinct um they're the two you've got to kind of keep coming back to is this different and distinct to everything else that is cropping up in people's inboxes which it can be difficult if you know you, you're all a, if you're an established brand and you've got a way of saying things. Um, it can be hard to to really kind of push the boat out on that creativity and be completely different without alienating people who are already kind of bought into your tone. Um, but I mean, again, it's it's like an old. It's, it's back to like one of those old fundamentals. If you put yourself in the person's shoes who's reading it, uh, and and I don't just say that um, as in you know think of your target target audience or you know think of your persona um say where is he going to be or where 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 is she going to be reading this when um when they open it um are they going to be on their way to work uh, you know are they going to what's going through their head are the kids going to be in the background while they're trying to do you got no chance then are you sending it at the right time so there's loads of loads of other kind of yeah. considerations to bring it to um, bring into it but yeah subject line first and foremost is number one and then within the email itself i always try and um try and tell some kind of story that's that's on um a particular theme so i'll focus on um, on one. So last week um, in my newsletter, I focused on. Um, I was talking about the um, the importance of indemnity insurance, um, which sounds yeah. really yeah. sounds really sounds really dull. But I I I um I received a letter from I've got it here actually. Yeah, here we go. I've received a letter from my insurer, Policy B. Um, only a really short one. Um, this thing. So I, I took a, a photo of this. Yeah. Stuck it on there and just did a little breakdown of why it was good. These types of letters, recommend the friend letters, they're normally really kind of dull and functional and they're written by like the customer care team. But that one, it was like you could tell a copywriter had worked on it and there was loads of nice little kind of humorous touches throughout. So I just broke that down. And then the subject line was how to write. Um, have I got it here? I can't even remember it now. It just shows I'm. This is how well we planned this. We should have had this ready because I remember the, the insurance letter. It was. So it's you know, it was yeah. nothing super fancy. It was it, it just worked. Yeah, just that that simple. Five ways to make a boring letter better. So there's a little yeah. bit of rhyme in there. There was a promise. So they're getting five ways. 
and yeah. some kind of value, which is taking a boring letter and, and giving it personality. So, yeah, I just for that email, I just had that theme. Right? How how can I, you know, receive this? It's it's anything but boring. Mm-hmm. So this is all going to be about the ways that this company have made that better, unboring, you know, more um, more attractive, more more enticing and engaging. Um, so I try and do that each week. I don't. I don't, you know, it's so easy to go right. I've got a thousand and one sales messages and, and a million key messages. We just focus on one thing. You know, it might yeah, be a that's right. My, my, email, my email is like normally eight hundred to twelve hundred words long. It's not. It's no. It's not short by any stretch. But right. there's still that one theme, and I touch on loads of different things within it. But there's always that one focus, which I think mm-hmm. if you can just keep that one focus in mind. Again, back to the back to think, thinking about the person that's reading it. You're not going to be confusing them. You're not hitting them with ah, oh, there's this, and then sign up for this, and then you've got that. It's like just kind of keep it nice and focused. Um, and yeah, I think people are going to get the message a lot more than than if you bombard them with 20, 20 different messages. So yeah, so first one is subject line. Second one is yeah, having that kind of running theme through it. And then yeah, the final one is just make sure it's it's. I always picture just one one person that I'm speaking to as well, so to, um, to elevate that tone. It's like, I, and I, like the last email, like say I was picturing you, Dave, reading it. Mm-hmm. I'm writing it like I'm writing it to you, to, yep. to you, like you're reading it. I'm not thinking, you know, at no point do I ever go, "Hi guys," or speak to yeah. people in oh, collective yeah. terms. It's just, which is, it sounds like really a really simple thing, but. It's 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 it can often be overlooked. So if I'm just doing that with you, just I know I'm speaking to you directly. It just allows me to give that kind of added personality to it and yeah. make it feel more personal. So I can go off on little tangents and you know add little um you know little little footnotes and side notes yeah. when I'm saying you know what Dave, where it's yeah. like I'm I'm almost in a room with you going you know what doing that face where I'm kind of giving you a little yeah. wink as to the next thing I'm going to. If you I think if you can picture that one person reading it, yeah, it allows you to add that um you know make it more personal and less like a you know, a kind yep. of a, a sales letter that, that you're just sending out with um, some kind of, um, you know, you're, you're only looking to to, mm-hmm. to get them to click something or buy buy from you. Yeah, I uh, I often, and this is, I don't know if this is a secret or not. If not, it doesn't matter. It's not like an important secret. I often am writing for my friend, uh, Frederick, who is like in, in Paris, uh, or I'll write for a, a friend of mine, Simon in Leeds. Uh, you know, I've got a couple people that like, depending Perfect. on the week I'm, I'm writing for. Right. Yeah. And it, you know, it, and it's really just for that. So it's like I'm trying to explain it um, to you, it, you know, yeah. and I'm, now I might even write some for you uh, because, you know, that you put it in my head. Uh, but what you know, and the way you were talking about, like putting yourself in other people's shoes, I go and tell people, like, oh, think about what it would mean, how you would feel if you got the same message. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, w- if you got this, it wasn't from you and it was from a different brand. Would you feel good or bad about it? Because like a lot of times when people send these really like um, crappy messages. Right. It's because they haven't taken the time to step back and like just think about it, like, oh, if I got this, would you know, would I respond to this or would I just like completely delete it? Right. You know, mm-hmm. it's the mm-hmm. same with like the phone. Right. Mm-hmm. If you think that like cold calling. Right. Because in America, there's still like this crazy cold calling culture in a lot of places. Do you answer your own phone if you don't know who the calls from? Not really. <laughs> I never do. No. <laughs> right. I, I sometimes don't. I just I don't mad. answer it when I see the name of the person. Yeah. Like, I'll call them back later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but one thing I am curious about, because you talked about the body, you talked about the the subject line. What about call to actions? Because you said, you know, like you'll, you, you know, you don't do a lot of selling in your newsletter now, and that's intentional. But obviously, as a copywriter, you do have to make a sale from time to time with your co- with your copy. You know, how do you handle that? Because if you don't, you know, because like a lot of times they're heavy handed, right? You know, um, you know, and if you and that works for some brands, but it doesn't work for every brand. And if you try to take a one size fits all approach, it's not very good. Mm. You know, so how do you deal with that? Yeah, it, I mean, calls to action, they're, they're, a fun, they're a funny old bunch, calls to action, especially buttons. You get button, you get these standard buttons like buy now and find out more and, you know, um, view, you know, go here, view this, click this link, whatever, which a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of copywriters and marketers out there I see trying to, um, they try and do things differently than that, you know, point taken, they're not. They're not the most kind of creative, but they are um, certainly by now. It's like you're not going to confuse anyone. If somebody says buy now, you know, by clicking that, a pair of trainers are going to pop up and you can buy that thing. So 
um, I think rule, rule one is always don't try and kind of reinvent the wheel if it already works. That said, you know, one, I, I, can, I, I can get, um, you know, if I'm working on a new client website and the, the wireframe, every link is find out more, find out more, find out yeah. more, or learn more, learn more. And I'm like, really? Find out more? Yeah. Is that going to really entice people to, um, if you can change those calls to action to what people are going to get? So, mm-hmm. you know, rather than find out more, if that's taking into case studies, you know, read a client story, read how this has worked. So just be really kind of pointed as to what is going to be yeah. contained on the next page. So they're calls to action within a website. But if, yeah, if it's if it's more ta- kind of tactical within a, um, you know, an email or, um you know, on social media, if you want people to buy things, I try and keep things nice and human and conversational, especially when I'm doing my, I mean, I'm not talking about myself here again, but if I'm doing a sign up to my newsletter within the, within the, um, the first comment underneath my LinkedIn post, um, I'll say, you know, want more silly stuff like this, um, <laughs> then get my Friday email. It's, it's full of, you know, writing tips, storytelling and whatever. So we'll say exactly what's in there. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll take the, the piss a little bit. So if I've written a story or if I've written a post about, you know, five ways to, uh, I did, <laughs> did one today actually talking about st- you know, stuff that we've done today. What was the one today? It was five ways to, um, was it write more engaging posts or something? You know, just bear with me a sec. I'll get, I've got a real, a real life example for you here. Um, so yeah, so sorry, no, it wasn't that one. Oh, I'm eating into our lovely podcast time here, mate. <laughs> they, see, this is where I don't edit too. So like, they get, <laughs> people get the real magic here. That happens. there you go. It's taking ten seconds. Up, I assure yeah. you, it's going to be worth it. So, um, so me opening line was, um. Does your massive re- reliable brain ever turn into a kind of thick peanut buttery sludge when thinking about what to write about on LinkedIn? I have a remedy. Turn to one of these five post ideas which are guaranteed to inspire, excite, engage, or enrage your potential clients. Um, so I then give five um, <laughs> five no-nos, really. So I'm taking the piss out of these these how-to posts. So number one is your morning routine, where I'm talking about, you know, the earlier you say that you wake up and the more things you can cram in before 9 a.m., the more pre- impressive you will Im- appear. So it's just a bit of a piss take your post. But my call to action at the very end was for more inspirational advice like this, and then in brackets, much of which is already being followed by many global linked influencers, get my Friday email. So it's just keeping the joke on. So if you can keep your call to action in the same tone yes. as everything else that you write, people will, um, it, I'm sure that if, if people are familiar with the brand, that they're more than likely um, you know, going to click it than if it was just a kind of throwaway. Yeah. I could there, I could have just put, sign up to my Friday email for more like this, but by keeping the tone going. And it's all, I almost see that like micro copy. It's like the stuff at the bottom of your website that people aren't really meant to read. But yeah. when they read it, if it's in your tone of voice, they go, fucking hell, they care about me more. They've they've gone to the effort to write that. This is a brand that clearly cares a little bit more, even if you don't think that. I think subliminally, if everything's within that tone and you, you know, you've got these distinctive brand assets, if that tone is on everything that you do, I just think it, it, it reinforces who you are, what you do, uh, and builds that trust without even kind of trying. So, um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of again another roundabout answer, but yeah, that's no, that's, one. that's what the podcast is for. They're good for roundabout answers, but that yeah. it's really important what you said because every touch point counts, and like those the 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 the, um, the nice stuff builds up slowly, right? Mm. But the bad stuff will t- um, tear you down very quickly. And so, like, all of these little bitty things, they add up over time. And then people go, mm. well, Dave cares, right? Like, you know, that's the whole the mm. whole point. It's like you're not mm. doing it necessarily just because you want to be f- funny. You, I mean, you do want to be funny, obviously. But the, you, you're doing it because you give a shit, right? Mm. You care mm. about people and you want people to understand, like, on, look, I'm taking the same care uh, in this while I'm trying to win you over or you, while you're in the sales process, imagine how you're going to feel once I'm done. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, what I, that's I say that's the brands all the time. If yeah. you know, if you, if you do take care with the time, even like your email signature, if you take care to make that entirely in your brand voice, people just people reading that will go bloody hell. If he cares this much with his signature, you know, imagine how much, um, focus he's gonna he's gonna put on my brand and helping our brand stand out so yeah it's it's back to those kind of subliminal stuff and i think yeah a lot of it is behavioral science it's the stuff that we don't really think about but um yeah it's, it's kind of proven to work you know yeah no that I, I couldn't agree more i um so 
I, I think I could go on with this thing for a long time, but I know that we have to get off here because we got a match kicking off in about five minutes here with the U.S. and Wales. Oh, sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, so we have to get to that. Um, where can everybody find The Word? Um, so you can get to The Word on my website, which is thewordman.co.uk. There's a big subscribe button on that. Um, and then also, if you connect with me on uh, LinkedIn, you really can't <laughs> you can't avoid it because I, I put a link to it at the end of every single post totally shamelessly but still still quite you know sillily and daft impressions matter right of course they do if i if i don't show up all the time that's top level brand awareness you might not have studied this but i'm here that somebody who did overstudy it is telling you that the top line stuff matters if you don't tell people what to do they can't Mm. do it Uh, yeah no this was a i i thank you for doing this i i I enjoyed it i probably could hopefully i'll get you to come back at some point because this was great um i think like even if it's just for the the part about the email breakdown this is totally worth it but um you know thank you so much for doing this and i do owe you a a beer from our bet between about the spurs liverpool match so i gotta send so so i gotta find out where your your local uh, weather spoons is so i can send you one over I can't believe that we beat Tottenham. How did that happen? <laughs> Tottenham were on form. We were playing yeah. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. The second half we were strong too, but we gave you know, well, you, you give a uh, you give a good team or even a, a good team that's struggling a yeah. lead, you can't yeah. you can't beat it. Tough. Just goes to show, doesn't it? Anyway, I hope I hope the USA win tonight. I'm England, aren't I? So I don't I'm not really bothered if Wales lose, but <laughs> I know I know that I'll probably lose a few followers to that um for that, but yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah, but you'll pick up some Americans. Yeah, it's a bigger on, country. USA. That's true. It's That's a bigger true. country. Working See, the you're, percentages. you're playing, yeah, you're playing <laughs> to the crowd. The bigger crowd. Yeah. What did you think of my conversation with Dave Harlan? Send me a note. And let me know. It's Dave at DaveWakeman.com. If you like what I'm doing with the podcast, make sure you share it with somebody. Uh, rate and review it. All these things help. Gets me exposure to a larger, larger audience. Helps me continue to get great guests like Dave Harland. Uh, make sure you get the Talking Tickets newsletter. It's TalkingTickets.Substack.com. Comes out every Friday. Check out my website, DaveWakeman.com. Connect with my friends at Booking Protect, a cover genius company. Like I mentioned at the start, they will be at Intix in Seattle in January. Uh, www.bookingprotect.com. Lots of data to show you. Uh, People are taking up refund protection at greater numbers than ever before. Uh, With the partnership and the combined efforts of Booking Protect and Cover Genius, there's new technology solutions, new ways to use refund protection, lots of new opportunities. Uh, so don't miss a chance to connect with them. Uh, www.bookingprotect.com to find out more. As always, I want to thank you for listening to the podcast, reading the newsletter, uh, engaging with me, working with me, doing all these things. Uh, it's still been a tough few years for everybody. So if you need somebody to talk to, don't hesitate to send me a note, Dave at DaveWakeman.com. If I can just, you know, be a shoulder to lean on or somebody that just cracks a couple bad dad jokes, you let me know because um, I couldn't do all this stuff without you. Um, until next time, thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.